I would like to call the uh, Sunderland Elementary School Committee meeting to order uh, May 18th at uh, 5.05 p.m. And uh, we have a quorum and we're, we're waiting our, our new member. Um, let's see. So uh, until she arrives, uh, the first item on the agenda is a presentation by uh, CPAC. Uh, Asia? Oh. oh, we're good. We're here. Hello. Hi there. Sorry about that. All right. Back to welcome Megan. Megan. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to school committee. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Sorry, I'm late. No worries. I think I had a couple of emails. So one link wasn't actually letting me join. So thank you for the call. It made me realize that people were here. So anyway, I'm here now. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Asia, you want to go ahead? Yes. Hello, everyone. And thank you guys for having us tonight. My name is Asia Cerrone, and I co-chair the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. The law requires us to evaluate special education systems and advise the district on the safety and education of students with disabilities. Our organization has been an official CPAC for just over a year now, so this is our first annual report. This has been a very difficult year for everyone um, and an interesting year to get started as a CPAC, but we wanted to thank everybody teachers, related service providers, instructional assistants, and administrators for going above and beyond for students this year. The flexibility and dedication everyone has shown has been amazing, and we are so appreciative. The district did a fantastic job providing in-person learning, and while IEP students benefited from this, they will still take longer to catch up due to their disabilities. We hope that this will stay in the forefront during programming and budgeting decisions for years to come. With support from the special education department, we were able to hold our monthly meetings and workshops remotely via Zoom. We held informational webinars and also provided caregivers opportunities to get support and network with each other. We met with a variety of administrators to discuss COVID reopening, um, elementary technology in regards to the remote classrooms, elementary PD, IEPs and 504s at Frontier and disability inclusion. Administrators, principals, staff, and school committee members have attended our CPAC meetings throughout this school year. While there are many wonderful things happening in this district, we are tasked with the responsibility to evaluate the special education programming. We went over the district policies, procedures, state data, and got input from families through surveys, support groups, and emails. Through this process, we have found concerns about special education compliance, documentation, communication, and training to varying degrees throughout the district. We found the special education related policies and procedures to be adequate and the manual was a little hard to find on the website, but I think that's a pretty easy fix. Um, in terms of state data, families can, um, or staff or community as well, can um, report to DESE, which they use the problem resolution system, PRS, um, and PRS investigates claims to determine whether a school is in compliance or non-compliance of the law. Due to a delay at PRS, we were unable to get official data summarizing the total number of complaints from each school, so we had to rely on unofficial data from CPAC families. There were six reports from Sunderland CPAC families that we spoke to um, that filed PRS complaints in the past year, but we may not have gotten into contact with everyone. It was just the people we had on our email list that would have given us that data. Families can also go to the Bureau of Special Education Appeals about concerns. The BSEA conducts due process hearings and renders rulings and decisions. While the BSEA doesn't keep data for individual schools, as a whole, they received 11 notifications of rejected IEPs from our district within the past year. Concerns that were brought up numerous times by multiple families were included in this report. And I'm going to start by going over the district-wide concerns and recommendations, and then we'll get more specific into Sunderland later in the presentation. Overall, special education teachers, IAs, and related service providers do an amazing job. They foster personal relationships and a sense of community that is a major strength for this district. However, families are concerned that staff are being overloaded with IEP paperwork, meeting, lengthy assessments, and filling in for other staff, in addition to their regular duties. Families are worried about the burnout potential 
and the missed services that result from this overload. Most school districts, including Frontier, have a special education team leader to deal with IEP paperwork, scheduling meetings, and performing evaluations, but our elementary schools do not. This puts a great deal of additional responsibility on our principals and special ed teachers. We recommend that the district hires a special ed team leader, and this new position would make our schools more attractive to highly qualified applicants and decrease the burnout risk for our current special education teachers. There are concerns with central offices, documentation, and adherence to legal timelines. State and federal laws make it very clear what documentation is required and when it needs to be provided to caregivers. We've heard numerous violations of these laws. The frequency varies by school, but most of them were from Sunderland. This may sound like a minor paperwork issue, but these delays lead to months of missed services. IEPs are provided on a three-year cycle. The first year is a comprehensive evaluation, which gives the school district 45 school days to get the IEP to the family. The following two years are updates without any evaluations, and the school has 10 school days from the meeting to get the family the IEP. New services cannot start until the family has received and signed the IEP. CPAC parents report that the district takes twice the typical time frame for each of these situations. If the 45 school day evaluation takes 90 school days and the 10 school day period for each of the two years between takes 20 school days each, that child has now gone an extra 85 school days, which is approximately four months over a three year period without getting the updated support that they need. If a student is on an IEP their entire life, they will have five of these IEP cycles, which would be 20 months or two school years of missed services due to paperwork delays when they're already behind all of their peers due to their disability. We recommend that IEP meetings and paperwork get standardized and streamlined to ensure that the district is in legal compliance. In our district, IEPs are often written in vague terms, which makes it difficult for staff to follow the document. Unlike general education students whose curriculum standards are determined by DESE, the IEP guides the curriculum standards for many students with disabilities. Having vague wording makes it difficult for teachers to know what should be taught or how to measure progress, which can lead to a subpar education. We feel that it's important that all special education teachers and related service providers get PD on IEP development, timelines, and the district special education procedures manual. Our special education department was not reporting rejected, partially rejected, or unsigned IEPs to the state until midway through this school year. When schools report these to the state, the family gets an information packet on their rights and next steps. When they are not reported to the state, families do not receive this information and cannot make informed decisions. Due to COVID, many IEP students were in remote only, sub-separate classrooms or unable to stay in the classroom for whatever reason. We recommend that professional development and training on managing behavioral issues be provided to all staff, including general ed, special ed, related service providers and instructional assistants, and that schools develop individual action plans to support high need students as we return to normal. The CPAC also recommends that the district-wide anti-racism initiative continues to expand to include a variety of minority populations, including students with disabilities. More specifically now, Sunderland has 63 IEP students, which is approximately 34% of the student body, which is the highest in the district. There are five special education teachers, which is a special ed teacher to student ratio of 13 to one, which is typical for this district. Sunderland families have stated that they did not know who their IEP liaison, which is their point person, um, who that person was year to year, and they didn't have an adequate transition plan in place. We find that the highest need students are having these transition meetings, but it's the students who have maybe an IEP just for reading or just for math who are not getting these meetings. And as a result, they do not know who their contact person is the next fall. We recommend offering a phone or email conversation or a full transition meeting to all IEP students every school year. There are reports that families have requested IEP evaluation to general education teachers, but never received one. We recommend that all general education teachers are informed that any request or concern regarding special education be immediately referred to the director of special education and that families receive a permission to evaluate form as required by law. The law requires IEP meetings to include an administrator who can commit funds and services. This is so the IEP can be completed during the meeting 
but there have been reports that meetings at Sunderland do not always have someone able or willing to commit funds, further delaying the IEP process. As stated in our district-wide concerns, Sunderland families report that it takes beyond double the time, but actually four to eight weeks after an IEP to receive the document when the law states that they should have it within two weeks. Families have also reported that special education teachers do not have enough time in their schedules to provide all the services or, that or they have to substitute for one-on-one -on -one instructional assistance, leading them to miss their own duties that day. Others have come to us with concerns that there's not enough staff in general or that underqualified staff are providing IEP services. Sunderland Special Education Liaisons are required to provide direct services to students, modify general education curriculum, attend IEP meetings, administer special education assessments, in addition to writing IEPs. Based on our conversations with families and staff, we believe that this increased responsibility placed on them impacts the experience for students, teachers, and families, and has begun to impact the ability to follow legal requirements as well. Again, we strongly recommend that the district hire a special education team leader to take the administrative duties off special education teachers and allow them to focus on teaching. We are concerned with reports from families of repeated physical escorts, restraints, and exclusionary timeouts at Sunderland Elementary over the past three years. This was the only portion of the report that we looked back three years to pre-COVID times instead of one because some families were in remote only situations or hybrid situations this year. And they're worried that upon returning to normal, it will become an issue again. To avoid that possibility, we recommend professional development on the district's school restraint prevention and behavioral support procedures be provided to all general education staff, special education staff, related service providers and instructional assistants so that we can reduce these methods. The district policy on physical restraints has no mention of physical escorts or exclusionary timeouts. We recommend that this policy be updated to include them. There's a district procedure on physical restraints, escorts and exclusionary timeouts, but the language is not consistent throughout the document. The CPAC recommends that any instance of the word restraint be modified to say restraint, escort, or exclusionary timeout for clarity throughout the document. We also recommend adding language about specific timeframes to improve clarity and accountability of that procedure. There's poor visibility for that document within the school community. We hadn't had a single parent that was familiar with it, so we would recommend that the district provide a digital copy to parents and staff on a yearly basis. DESE's school, dis school and district report card statistics on student discipline highlights a troubling trend at Sunderland Elementary. Student discipline rates have increased for students with disabilities from 0% to 8% over the last three years, but not for the total population, which has only slightly increased to 2.1%. While the Massachusetts state average for students with disabilities is 3%, Sunderland is at 8%. We recommend that students with disabilities who require discipline be referred for a functional behavioral analysis and behavior intervention plan so that they do not become repeat offenders and add to this list. Um, are there any questions? Any questions, comments? Go ahead, Jessica? Uh, just wondering if there was any conflation of IEPs and 504s within this report. When you talked about 34% are on IEPs, does that include 504s or is that separate? So 504 plans are not considered special education. They are considered general education. And the law on CPACs is kind of tricky because we have the ability to assess and evaluate special education, but not general education. But we do have the ability to look out for the safety and well-being of students with disabilities, which would include 504. So half of our job, we can include them and half we can't. So it's a little tricky when you write up these reports. Peter? Oh, Peter? Hi, Asia. Um, thank you for the report and the work you're doing. Um, you recommend, one of your recommendations is that uh, that as you as I believe you phrased it, that the district hire a, a special education team leader. Um, it's 
you know, we we will be discussing later, I believe, a proposal to have a special education team leader for, I think, just Sunderland Elementary School. But you were, so were you proposing that that a team leader for each elementary school or one for the union? Or I wasn't clear what your proposal was. So as a CPAC, we feel that every school needs somebody, whether that is a shared person or an individual person. Um, but from our report and all the data we've gathered, it really seems like Sunderland is the biggest issue out of the district. So, I mean, if we had to have one anywhere, it would probably be needed here more than the others. And and do you have, I, I realize that, that perhaps this question is best, you know, answered in very general terms, if at all, but um, we have a, a greater proportion of, we have a different population here in Sunderland. Okay. And, you know, there are various reasons maybe for it, or maybe it's just the randomness of life. But um, do you have any thoughts about, you know, the fact that, that we have a, a, a greater percent of, of, of children and, you know, have special needs that, that uh, I, I'm just curious. And, and I, I realized that, you know, that may be something that. Well, I think part only of it say is so much. Well, part of it is that Sunderland does have a great program. It's a school that attracts a lot of families. Um, we moved here specifically for this school. We weren't from this area. So I think that there's a lot of really great aspects of this community that people want to come to. Um, and then it also depends on what housing is available and that sort of stuff. But I think it's a combination. Yeah. I, I mean, I was wondering if, you know, sometimes that, you know, the, the better your program is, the more you attract people to it and the more difficult it gets to maintain the program because you just have a higher workload. And, and you know, the one of the fundamentals of public schools is you take everybody who walks in the door. And um, so, I mean, that's a, it's an inherent conflict, I guess, in the system. Yeah, and I think as numbers get higher, that's when we have these conversations and we figure out what can we adjust so that we can get back to being that school that everyone is looking towards again. Right. That of having a lot of issues kind of coming up. Right. Because I mean, we're, you know, we're constantly struggle here with with trying to get the resources um, to run the school, you know, the way it needs to be run. And by resources, I mean, you know, both funds and uh, personnel and time and so on. And all those things are not easy. Um, so that, you know, you're always making compromises. And anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to say thank you as well. I think, uh, oh, go ahead, Keith. I just had a couple questions. Uh, one would, um, thanks, Peter. I was going to kind of ask about the same thing, the special ed team leader kind of position. But correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, is, isn't that similar to a, a position that you had asked us to consider previously, something along those lines, and we and we didn't follow through on that? I uh, yeah for the past few years okay yeah um and then I was just wondering um what either uh, either you or Karen thought about the report and uh, you know some of the implementations that transmission transition meetings and some of like the the missed reporting and then the, how like what would how, what was your thought about the your thoughts about the report I can chime in hi I first my um Thank you. I think it's a very uh, comprehensive report. Um, I think working, uh, there are many specific, if you have specific questions, I really uh, could answer them my, from my perspective. In the first few meetings, I said, you know, I really need time to sort of digest the evaluation uh, and really look into it and kind of set priorities. I still really need that time, but I have now had a little bit of time and have heard it and able to digest it. Um, and I think overall, it, it provides a lot of information uh, and be able to, uh, for the district to really set those priorities. I think the educational team leader position per se is a great recommendation. And as it's been mentioned, uh, it's been brought up before. Uh, it helps not just, it helps in so many different ways. It helps with coordination of services. It helps with communication which a lot of, um, you know, the intent is good, but it, the system could break down in any given spot. And you really, that position helps coordinate from the very beginning of looking at eligibility to 
termination, setting those meetings. And as Asia and Holly's report, or rather the CPAC's report stated, um, and really kind of taking, freeing up the teachers to focus on that instruction. So I think that would be a vital role to really looking at, you know, how do we do the professional development? I think the recommendations, especially coming off of this year, um, of really looking at that professional development to go over the procedural manual, uh, to go over our procedures, to have an opportunity for the faculty and staff to have a I don't know if it's just me, but Ben, do I, I lost Sarah. Ben, maybe you want to finish? Yeah, sure. I, I think we have been saying for a few years that the team lead position at Sunderland Elementary School would absolutely help um, our teaching staff as a whole moving moving forward. Um, in, in terms of the, the report, I thought it was uh, very well written, a lot of good um recommendations um although so although i i think just with with boots on the ground some of the numbers might be um skewed a little bit and might not be a true representation of what's happening at sunderland um we are taking the feedback and appreciate the feedback and we'll be able to take a closer look at it um over the summer and and come up with some good plans moving forward Hi, I'm back. Um, this is just a little awkward to hear you a freeze and not sure uh, where I was, but thank you. Again, I think it's it's a matter of looking at the priorities and having that ongoing communication uh, with the school committee uh, for you to add to you to digest it. I'm happy to come back uh, with and continue to communicate with the CPAC and continue to communicate with our faculty and our administration um, and the school committee upon the specifics in it and give you time to digest it and ask those questions. But again, I think um, overall, there could be sp some specifics that we could uh, really add information or discuss. I mean, for me, to be honest, just looking at the numbers now uh, and the enrollment and where that puts uh, the and <laughs> where that puts the uh, and the um, Sorry, I got some feedback. I'm having a little uh, technical difficulties, as you can tell. Uh, that, that the percentages have gone up significantly uh, with a decrease in enrollment, uh, just kind of showing that we do have a higher percentage of special education than we did in the last years. Uh, and again, I'll just reiterate that that coordination of services and that communication uh, is, is very important and taking that pressure off of our teachers uh, to have, uh, to be in the role of facilitating the meetings um, and doing the educational evaluations. And we've been talking about it for a while, so I think uh, coming off of this year where communication was very difficult, especially when you're relying on internet access and Conway, I shouldn't give my whereabouts. But um, uh, so I, I think for the most part, it's an ongoing communication. I'm, if you have specific questions about the report, I'm happy to answer them, but I'm also happy to come back and continue that conversation. I hope that answers your question. Megan, I saw you had your hand up for a second. I did. I was just trying to get an understanding of um, the, the, you said that you were, were mainly reaching out to families by way of emails and getting a lot of the information and feedback in that, um, in that respect. And I was just curious how many, how many families did that, uh, how many families was were, were there that you actually spoke to? Um, and then the, the PRS system, did you say that there was, it, you weren't able to get that data? Are you able to get that at a certain time? And, and, and just curious about that a little bit further. Yeah, so our email list is over, I think it's over 150 families throughout the district. Um, we get a pretty good showing from Sunderland at our meetings. Um, there's a pretty strong community there. We have a higher percentage of students. And then there's also just families who are really interested in improving things and want to join our organization. Um, 
So the ones that we, I mean, we send it out to everyone on the email list and it's whoever replies. So sometimes it's who had time, who um, feels really strongly about it. That sort of stuff is kind of how we get our data. Um, and then the other piece, we get a lot of it from our support meetings. So we have two a month. We have our public meeting. Um, we usually have like a 30 minute official type meeting with administrators or staff, anyone who wants to come. And then we close the group and just have the parents stay. And that's where we get to ask each other questions and raise concerns. So we get a lot of our information there. Um, and I mean, the PRS, we're hoping we get some information from them. We've just been playing email tag with them for almost two months now. Um, the BSEA got right back to us. PRS, they told us that they're just really overrun right now. And as soon as they can, they would. But I'm not sure when we'll get that data. Thank you. I, I just wanted to throw in, uh, yeah, definitely, we, we all acknowledge that uh, but for funding crutches, this position has been a priority and, and uh, it needs to get filled. Uh, I will probably touch base with uh, maybe Ben, Darius, and, and Karen regarding the, uh, you know, is it typical in schools to have policies regarding the uh, exclusionary timeout escort and restraint stuff? Is that is policy falls under school committee, so that would be something more direct for us. But uh, definitely appreciate the general feedback and uh, and also, you know, agree that uh, with things like compliance with direction, uh, you know, DESI guidance, et cetera. Uh, it's not just filling the position. Also, uh, it doesn't just raise expenses. It makes us more effective and it uh, decreases risk for compliance issues that can become their own uh, expenses. And obviously, any kids who don't get their needs met younger also need more services later on. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely not... Uh, a frivolous expense. Thank you for making those points, Greg, because that's exactly um, we want this program to keep growing and doing well. And filling that position would really change the dynamic of things and also, yeah, decrease what's needed down the road. If kids aren't missing two years over their lifetime of services, they could be living a very different life as adults. And then society in general is paying less as well. Indeed. All right. Uh, if that's it, then uh, thank you again. And uh, on to, let's see. Agenda. All right. Review and approve the minutes, April 13th. I'll make a motion. A second. Any second? Just a second. Uh, all in favor? Or, you know, we have a roll call? Aye. 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 Oh, Aye. Outstanding. Roll five hands up. All right. Life is good. Um, and then it's on to the financial statements and warrants. Shelly? Hi. Um, so while we're talking about this new position, why don't I start with that, if that's okay, since it's fresh on everyone's minds. Uh, so this was in the report that I sent out that we are making uh, a recommendation. The administration is making a recommendation to hire the special education team leader, even though it was off the table during the budget process. Um, it's clear that there is a need for this role, and I did give you a little bit of a description from the job posting or the job description uh, that will be used if we do move ahead with the hire. Um, but financially, uh, I do think we can afford this right now. Um, we have an IA who has resigned, so the idea would be to eliminate that position versus rehiring. It's sort of the perfect time for us to make those kinds of decisions because we're not eliminating a person's job because they're no longer here. Um, and so that would cover about 28,000 of the salary, which would probably about be about a $60,000 salary. And then the remainder could be paid from school choice. Our special education uh, claim increments are up for school choice this year. I think Karen said about $75,000. 
um, which in my short history with the school, this is the second year that we've had a significant special education claim increase for uh, school choice. So um, clearly there's a need at the school. And if we have those funds coming in, it does make sense, I think, financially to spend them on a special education position. Um, and then the, any remaining overage, you know, obviously would just go towards our school choice cushion. Um, and then funding for the future, you know, I'm always thinking ahead that, you know, we're adding a position right now that we have a funding source and we have a solution today. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a solution for the following fiscal year. So we will have to have that conversation. I'm sure some of you have that on your mind already. I know how um, you're already looking ahead in, in future years, but I, I think we could make it work. And I think that it's clearly a need at this point, something that we have to find a way to support. Uh, I can take financial questions about that, or I can switch gears to the rest of my update. Up to you all. Peter? Peter. Uh, the IA position that you will uh, not replace the person, obviously that person was doing something, um, you know, playing a role and not replacing it. I wonder what the... Um, what the uh, impact of not replacing that would be and whether that's something that we should be concerned about. Yeah, we talked about that. And right now we feel that with the addition of the team lead position, that will help in all areas of the building, um, which will eliminate the need for that particular IA position. And I guess since Karen is also here, Karen, the, the 75, thousand is a rough estimate of um extra sped increment that's in relation to what starting point it's in real, uh, what we do is we uh, when shelly starts uh, or the district starts working on its budget proposal it uses the preliminary uh special education or the preliminary school choice numbers which includes the number of school choice students you have and a a guesstimate or an estimate using uh, the placement codes for special education and how much each student's special education increment form. For those of you who don't speak the language so much, it's when you have school choice students, uh, school choice receiving, there's a, a five, there's a, there's a number for each student. And then you take the IEP for each school choice student on an IEP and we plug in those grid services and it's called a special education school choice. It's a school choice special education increment and it's added. So the preliminary numbers that come out in January are pretty much a guess or a working number uh, for budget proposals and that DESE offers. But then um, I do the, the form itself sometime in April and I posted it. And when I posted it and when I completed it, it showed that the increment forms that I posted to DESE were coming out about $75,000 more uh, than the preliminary amounts in January that came out from DESE in January. Okay, that's that's the comparison I was looking for, so thank you. Um, Shelly, you'll provide, like you, you, you've been doing occasionally, it sort of might be nice to see it just as a regular part of your financial report, just the, the the very quick summary of this of the school choice uh, fund, meaning you know year end you know in revenue expenses and projected you know or year beginning and then expenses and revenue and then projected year end because that's real useful to just sort of make sure that we're not digging ourselves into a hole. Yeah, absolutely. So in June, I will have an update on all of our revolving funds, including school choice. Um, and I, my hope is that I can have the COVID stuff cleaned up with the town. The town is behind on reimbursing us for COVID expenses. So if you look at the school choice right now, it's really heavy because that's where we paid vendors from waiting for the town to pay us back. And so I'm, I want to get that all cleared up because we actually might have spent a little bit more than the town was reimbursing us because we just needed things. So. I will absolutely have that for June. Um, I haven't provided it because it's. I don't think it's a real number right now. I mean, it would be worst case scenario, but I'd rather give you better figures. Uh, um, I'm meeting meeting with Jeff tomorrow, so I'll definitely have that for you. Yeah, I mean, I know the town got a new accountant this spring, and so some things have taken a bit to get that person on board properly. So. 
Yep. We're meeting um, David, Jeff, and I tomorrow to talk about all things school related and make sure we're buttoned up and cleaned up before the end of the year. So, okay. The other thing I'd like <laughs> to ask again, just look into the future, is because two of those uh, special funds, meaning the school lunch fund and the uh, early childhood fund, um, we have sort of, you know, we we set ourselves the task of getting the revenues back to normal revenues over the course of the next year. And it would be nice to get a regular um, update as to progress in, you know, generating revenues in those accounts. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm more concerned in that side of it than the spending side, because that's where, you know, to avoid a problem, uh, you know, nine months from now when we're doing the next budget, uh, uh, we need to have those accounts back to, you know, fully generating revenue. And, and it would be nice to have some regular updates on that. Yeah, and that's part of my task right now. Um, again, making sure that we're reconciled with the town that we have booked is what they have booked and that our numbers actually match. Um, this was also part of my report that school choice, not school choice, I'm sorry, school lunch. I do think we're going to have to reallocate some of the salaries and wages that we paid on school choice over to the general fund. Um, we don't want to fully deplete our school lunch account. And if we have some savings this year that we can help support that account, I think we should. That'll be a June conversation. Um, early childhood is is pretty bleak in Sunderland. I want to say there's been like $10,000 in revenue. Um, but we are expecting programs to return to normalcy for next year. So uh, I sent out a budget workbook to Amy um, Smithioli, our early childhood director this week so that she can start inputting student enrollment so that we can look at revenue. And I have asked her for a deadline of early June so that at the next meeting, you can get um, year to date rollover projections and then looking ahead to next year, what we're anticipating revenue to be. So I absolutely, it's on my radar. I will get it to you. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so, the, I mean, that's sort of along the lines, everything that Peter's talking about is basically our end of year wrap up. So I'm looking at all of those revolving funds. Um, I'm looking really closely at Sunderland's general fund budget, because if you remember 90,000 from savings this year, what we're trying to do when we froze the budget, um, to support next year. So right now there's about 230,000 remaining in the general fund budget to be spent. Uh, some of that obviously still will get spent down because not everything might be encumbered. Uh, we have a purchase order deadline of May 26th. So uh, I'm working with Ben and, and Layla at the school to make sure that all of the POs are in the system and funds are encumbered where we need them to be. And then ensuring that we have that 90,000 moving forward for next year. Um, there could be more than that at this point. It's still, you know, I'm still analyzing, but that's really what it's all about right now as we start to close down our books. And again, I'll have a, a better update for you in June. Um, but right now I feel like we're in good shape. We're not gonna have a problem coming up with that $90,000 because of the budget freeze. And at the same time, I, I don't know how Ben would feel about this, but I've, I've seen the POs coming in. They're ordering what they need. We're finding funding sources. If it's not from general fund, we're in conversation about how to get things so that the school's not suffering, even though, um, we are having a little bit of financial trouble. So um, trying to balance all of that out, basically. Uh, okay. And then the only other thing, oh, did someone have a question? You go ahead and then I go, Peter. Okay, I was just gonna state the warrant amount um, for the record. Uh, there were 12 warrants signed electronically, totaling $93,100.97. Great, and my question was, and I'm not sure whether addressed to you or to Darius, and that is um, what sort of uh, process we should be doing to, uh, as far as this uh, proposal to hire a special education team leader. Is this something that, um, for example, we're wanting to move ahead with right now and therefore you'd like a vote from the com committee now supporting it? Is this something that you were gonna toss out at this meeting and try and get a vote at our next meeting? I didn't know what you hadn't, you know, what were you thinking about? Yeah, it's a good, I was waiting for kind of the, should I just summarize there before I jumped in and kind of said, we needed to have it, <clears throat> we need to have some action on this in the sense that, so I don't know, this is where kind of a, it's a gray area and maybe someone has the clarity of the gray area, but we have a set budget and we're proposing to do some staff changings within that budget and being a smaller, small school committee overseeing a smaller, but overseeing a small budget, you know, we have these like, 
we vote on things that may not be under the law. My thing is, it's not posted in tonight's meeting to take a vote. However, um, I'm not sure if I need a vote. We always work together, so I'm not saying like I'm, I'm going to do my own thing. I take my ball and go home. I'm not sure if I need a vote directly in order to change within their position. So I look for an opinion on that. We could vote it on June, but my one thing is that I do want to get that position posted. So if we want to formally vote it in, so if we have to do a technicality, we can formally vote it in June, and we can post it as an anticipated position with a straw vote so that we you know, we make sure we, we do everything. But I want to get in the market before the market dries up. And this is kind of one of those things where we, for those of the public watching, like what the heck is going on here with that school, is that we, we thought about this earlier on. The school committee had long discussions about this position and we've been kicking this can down the road. And I think we, we do need to kind of stop and say, you know what, we need this now. We made a small reduction in, in, in staffing in order to make it. We found some money that does not change next year's budget at all. Um, let's fund it for this year and then we'll figure that out because we have kids who need this now and the teacher support that need this now and such. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm requesting that, you, you know, you, you back that and we figure it out a little further down the road, which is not exactly how we always do things because Shelly's said to me, you know, how are we gonna fund this next year? Well, um, you know, we have this problem now. We'll be able to figure that out as time goes on. And if we have to next year, um, reorganize things based on what we have. Um, then we may have to reorganize things, that kind of stuff. But um, I, I'd rather not put those needs of kids on hold another year as we wait till the following year looks like the windfall is coming that's gonna be able to you know, forever move forward on that. So anyway, so to summarize back to the beginning, as I, as Megan, you just learned, sometimes this happens to me. Um, I guess we'll take, take a straw vote. We can formally vote at next meeting. I could also get advice if you have to actually vote it if we're not changing the budget. Yeah. Your thoughts on that? If, if, okay. if I can just throw in uh, two cents. I also know that uh, when you're looking to hire people too, that, that it's time critical and there's certain windows where you can, it's easier to find people. Uh, so I, I would oppose. I would post for the rest of the school committee and feel free to let me know. If, if unless anyone thinks it's necessary to vote this, uh, shall we just discuss that? Is, is anyone uh, opposed to this? You know, is saying, hey, this is something we need to look into a little more, or, uh, or shall we just uh, allow Darius to do what he believes is inside of his purview? I see a thumbs up from Jessica, Megan as well. He's got that. Oh, go. How long do you anticipate it would take to fill a position? Uh, you post for two weeks, interviews for a week, same lesson possibly, if depending on you know the role we're going to do there. So I think that usually it's a it's a three week it's a three week range. So you're going to be the problem is that right now, as you know, it's the window. Right. All our other schools the applications are out. Everybody's looking for special education as well. So if we're going to lure um, those people to, you know, the quality, um, pro, you know, the quality our school brings where people are going to be attracted to come to it, I'd rather not wait until after school gets out because you already have your movement happen. Yeah, I think, I mean, my guess is like we all seem to be in agreement of moving forward on this position. It's just a matter of how's, how to do it the right way. And if it's going to take three to four weeks up to a month to to actually fill before you hire, we can make the recommendation that you fill the position with a vote coming in. I mean, we took the straw vote now and then we make the recommendation you move on this and we will formally vote it next meeting. And I think maybe that's the right way to do it. Okay. Peter, you had something? Yeah, I'd just like to say that that even though, you know, this may look like it's sort of a new item, uh, you know, I can certainly recall discussions uh, with the administration over the past couple of years about the need for this position. It was something we were trying to get in the budget uh, going back. I think it was, you know, back a couple cycles, even we were talking about it. Um, you know, I also, I mean, Asia, I read your and Holly's report. I actually read it a couple of times and it becomes pretty clear in there that this is something that we need to be doing. And then you know, finding out from Karen that, that uh, you know, my concern about, you know, often is, well, okay, how do we pay for something? And so it's real nice to be uh, getting a good number for Karen for what's expected to be year end for the uh, school choice fund where we're going to be drawing part of the salary fund. So, you know, I think that we just need to get this moving ahead and, and 
you know, if the vote of the next meeting is good enough without slowing you down, then that's, you know, that seems okay. Yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to to vote it in order to give it a uh, uh, the stamp of the school committee that it is an approved thing, but I definitely would not want to slow down the process in any way, shape, or form to wait on the vote. So, uh, I don't know, Darius, is, is is that direction clear enough for you, or? Uh, yep, we'll, we'll post it as, uh, we'll post it and let's begin the process, and then um, at the same time, I'll also make sure we get the proper language on the vote and so on and so forth. So I'll know we can. Thank you. All right. And uh, if that's it on the financial stuff, shall we? Okay. Well, I guess we're on to uh, public comment. And I know that uh, Vicki Palmer, our head of school, uh, is, is here uh, with something. Yes, good evening. I want, to th I want to thank you all for your service to our community and for the care and oversight you provide to support our wonderful school. And a special welcome to Megan Arkin on her first term and continued thanks to returning steadfast school committee members representing our community. Um, my name is Victoria Palmer and I'm the school psychologist and counselor, the head teacher, and the Union 38 building representative for our union. And tonight I share the excitement of the final weeks of a truly unprecedented year while acknowledging the very hard work and the dedication of our administration, faculty and staff. Our students, their families successfully met the shifting challenges of constantly pivoting in support of new tenants for health and safety this year. We're almost to the finish line. And here's where I ask you on behalf of our faculty and staff for your continued care and discretion surrounding those all important health and safety protocols designed to ensure everyone stays healthy. Mask wearing has become even more politicized and those shifting unclear and risky parameters announced in the media each day are confusing. I encourage our school committee to carefully consider maintaining the district's clear outlined health and safety mandates in place until at minimum June 11th, when we can celebrate our successes. Science informs us mask wearing works so why play with fire now? I also want to formally recognize our talented, creative faculty and staff as they addressed the COVID-19 pandemic challenges, yet remain steadfast in their commitment to supporting all students. Please understand how difficult it is to teach a group of students, both in person and who are simultaneously remote. This year, more than any other year, teachers shared flexible strategies, met with students in small virtual groups and individually, expanded their own professional development using varied technology, all while masked and remaining six feet apart, sometimes wearing parkas to combat the cold. We helped one another because it's the Sunderland way but also because it's the best and right thing to do to reach and teach all learners. We became stronger together, forged solid relationships with our students and families, and embraced staying positive all while testing negative. Sunderland teachers shared light during an otherwise dark time, and for that, I am personally grateful. Finally, I want to remind the committee about upcoming contractual negotiations that will begin next academic year across the district. In light of rising healthcare costs, estimated to be approximately 7% for our employees this year, I ask you to keep in mind the aforementioned information 
and recognize our dedicated faculty in a manner they have more than earned. I appreciate your support and I welcome your input. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicki. All right, indeed. Greg? Yeah, go ahead, Peter. I'm Vicki, I just, sorry, but that phrase, staying positive while testing negative, I mean, that's, I hadn't heard it before and maybe everybody else has, but I think that's very nice. Thank you. Peter, I wanna share with you that when our pooled testing results come out and they are negative, there's a little round of cheering you can hear within the building. It's pretty special. So that has been a great assurance. Now you're, you doing, all, you're doing you, great. You all have been wonderful through this incredibly difficult year. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, correct me, is this the last meeting that we have before students finish? Is our next meeting after students are out of school? This is the last one. Okay, so I guess I would say I'd like to th uh, thank you, Vicki. Um, I just keep repeating to my kids all throughout the winter, what, what you were doing is really is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And so what the teachers have done this year really was extraordinary. And there was a very fine line about trying to provide as much for kids as possible as doing it safely as possible. And, and I really admire what the teachers have done going in. Uh, I admire the administration of this district. It hasn't gone as well other places. I, and I think this, that the, the fact that it was done professionally, um, the staff, like you said, stuck together. It's just what what you all did all winter long was really remarkable. And, you know, I, I just go back to it was, it was extraordinary. So I just want to uh, make sure that every teacher in the building knows that. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, again, thank you, Vicki, and uh, and much appreciated. The, sorry, I saw Kelsey Crop is on here. Let's uh, let's maybe move that up, uh, and then we'll we'll do the COVID after. Alrighty, thank you very much. Um, so I apologize, my camera is not working. Um, we are kind of wrapping things up at the end of this year. Um, we had our first in-person discussion group at Frontier on Wednesday of last week. Um, and it was great. The kids really uh, were excited to be back in person. We're excited to be able to um, have that conversation. Um, and we're beginning to kind of brainstorm about next year um, and how they would like to be more connected to the elementary schools, what kind of mentoring programs might be possible. Um, and some of them mentioned being part of um, a leadership club or a leadership team in sixth grade and wondering if that could be um, something that we spread to all of the elementary schools and if that could be something that our older students help mentor um, moving forward, which I think is really exciting. Um, so we will have one more big full committee meeting before the end of the year um, to get our priorities hashed out for next year so that when we come back in the fall, we can hit the ground running and know, all right, these are the things we're focusing on. These are the things we're moving forward with. Um, so I wanted to give you all an opportunity to ask any questions about what we've done so far this year. Um, and let me know if there's anything that you would like the committee to discuss or consider when we meet um, in the next couple of weeks here. Comments, questions? I, I mean, I, I feel like yeah, the, the last uh, update we got from Amanda was also very, uh, very clear in terms of you know, it's, it's been a wild ride and you're really consolidating now. So, uh, you know, like you said, clean up this year and uh, exciting stuff for next. And uh, uh, again, uh, we, to you guys to work out to what extent you can do mentoring stuff across uh, between the, the various schools.
right. Well, thank you again, Kelsey. If no one has anything else, and uh, on to the COVID-19 update. Thank you. Oh, hi. Um, so I guess the COVID-19 update. Uh, basically, it was going to start off as pretty something really straightforward. Um, but yesterday, the um, the governor came on about noon. There was no, I, I just got to kind of lay the groundwork for this. There's no heads up to the schools that there was going to be this ma major change um, directed directly at schools. And I think, um, I, once again, I'm disappointed. Um, you know, I mean, I like, I know they're doing hard work and, um, and so on and so forth. But the fact there's no heads up that they're going to suddenly change things that requires a change in procedures or policy within 24 hours was kind of ridiculous. But we're here anyway. So yesterday um, I did send out to the school committee last night the um, basically an outline of what the, the they came out with and just to kind of, you know, I'll share my screen might be easier. Um, Basically, um, number one is the biggest is the biggest uh, change is that the, they came out basically saying that in consultation with the, the Mass COVID Command Medical uh, Center's Medical Advisory Board, the governor has announced to give given the low rate of outdoor transmission of COVID-19, students no longer have to wear masks when outdoors, even if distance cannot be maintained. Effective May 18th today, this guidance update applies to recess, physical education, youth sports, and outdoor learning environments. Adults must continue to wear masks outdoors if distance, distance cannot be maintained. Um, at this time, adults and students must continue to wear masks indoors. Okay, so that was kind of the the big um, the big announcement that came from the governor yesterday. So we have so where this causes you know um, issues is that we you know we voted a policy. The policy in there says that under advice from DESE, the CDC, and the Board of Health, um, we made the following mask face covering policy. Um, I'm looking to alter that policy um, until the policy can be updated. Um, this quick turnaround of basically under 24 hours, you know, by the time I got the email out to all you folks last night, it was the evening, um, um, would probably be happening at the next meeting where we'd update it because we'd have to, we got some weird problems ahead of us in the sense of what happens next year? What about the policies they real about the COVID and we have to update all of them going into next year? So I got to kind of plan that out and if the state continues to change, make those changes two days prior to, um, you know, a day prior to, no, not two days, a day prior to um, us having to make decisions, it's going to be far more difficult. But anyway, so what I'm looking to do is to, I, I kept, send out a note to those listening. I sent a note out to principals that says, you know, by Thursday, I'd like to see your, your schools in, have something in place to allow students to have masks off at recess. And allow teachers to set, you know, classroom procedures and, proto and pr you know, protocols for entering and exiting the building, where they're going to put their masks and that kind of thing. And so, um, some of the schools already went ahead and got it going today, um, and other schools are still processing the information because, again, the way it was kind of rolled out. I didn't do, you know, kind of a district top down, just kind of sent it out and said we're just going to do this all because. Right out of the gate, it was clearly that some buildings we need more time, probably mostly because of more students, um, more time to kind of get um, systems in place rather than just saying, you can't. I know for parents that are watching and such, it's, it's not just like you can take your mask off. It's like when you have a bunch of first graders walking outside, where do they put their masks? You're gonna, they're going to lose it between they put them down and whose mask is whose and that kind of stuff. you got to have orderly functions, especially if you're taking multiple outdoor breaks during the day. So. You know, so I asked, you know, I asked the principals to take two next two days to put something in place and try to get that up and running by Thursday. Um, at the same time, you know, we do have a school committee meeting. So it kind of falls into this weird thing where you guys are fortunate to have a full school committee meeting. This is falls into unanticipated in the, within 24 hours of the meeting. I did contact our attorney on um, this afternoon to see if, you know, if this does come up, if you wanted to make any decisions regarding policy. He said that does qualify. Within that, he's not was not anticipated. I could not have known the governor was going to make those remarks. Um, but so, how it, again, how it laid out now is that I've kind of made the executive interpretation of the policy that it's changed by the state's recommendation. And at the next meeting, I will bring you a new rewritten policy referring to, but it'll be after school gets out. We still have summer programs, so it'll apply through summer programs. 
and then we'll have to figure out what happens next fall and what does that look like. And so, um, you know, will there be vaccinations for all children? And will they have a plan in there? You know, all those kind of things, and see what the state recommendation is. So, again, another another kind of icky one, kind of like it's not really clear um, because it was kind of dropped off on us the last minute. Um, so, thoughts on that decision um, and so forth. Jessica? I don't particularly have thoughts about the procedure and process here, but um, I think I should say into the public record what I emailed with Darius about. Um, I have some reservations that this new guidance from DESE is not mirrored by CDC guidance. Um, and there have been other times this year that I distinctly felt that DESE was putting out guidance that was more supported by partisan politics than by science. Um, that said, this this new guidance generally feels acceptable to me with with my understanding of what you know causes risks for transmission, but that there are some situations that maybe we should carve out some exceptions. The specific one I emailed with Darius about is singing. Singing and yelling produce more aerosols that can transmit uh, viruses than regular speaking or breathing. Um, so, like we we should make sure that all of the staff know that singing they still need to be masked and six feet apart. Um, you know, and do some basic monitoring that kids are not yelling in each other's faces. Um, the science, so anybody who's watching who doesn't know, I'm an elementary music teacher. And um, so that's that's why the singing is a particular thing for me. At the very onset of the pandemic, there were some uh, super spreader choir rehearsal events that led to many, many deaths. Um, so we've known early on that um, the aerosols are are like a huge risk factor here. So I'm so the music teacher associations sponsored research into this, um, and you know they found that whether there's a breeze or not makes a major difference if you're outdoors with the aerosols. So like there are some exceptions with yelling, with singing, with stagnant air, which is not usually an issue here in New England, but um, there's a little room for nuance. Is I guess where I come down. Yeah. <laughs> And I kind of was saying to principals um, that the there's the common sense as well. You know what I mean? Like let's have some common sense outdoor mask off kind of thing. If kids are going to be playing inside a cardboard box outside, I don't know, I don't do elementary recess duty, but inside a cardboard box outside, I think the teacher can say, you know, we're gonna have to have masks on for that activity if you're gonna be climbing inside a cardboard box. You're in a, you're, you know, that kind of, I don't know like, where I came up with something where they're enclosed in where that kind of thing would happen. Um, if a class is outside as well, um, I think the teacher has still has control to say, you know what, masks can be on during this class because of the activities that we're doing isn't really full distance. So I think um, it's not as easy as like the MIA came out and said all athletic sports, you don't need them at all. It's kind of a blanket thing for older kids. I think when we're in a classroom, the teacher still has control and can set some, some um, limits to that. But the general idea is that they can have masks off. Um, and, and we look at the weather ahead this week, it's going to be hot the next two days because you haven't checked it. And so, you know, if they're running around playing tag and that kind of thing, that's not, you know, rugby football. That's, you know, that kind of thing. So not that they should be playing rugby football. But I hear what you're saying, Jessica, and I think, Ben, you're hearing us there as well. Yeah. And if I can just yeah, throw one, one more observation, both um, as a teacher and as a parent, that some of these kids uh, have self-identified as experts in in policy, mask policies, <laughs> for example. <laughs> it might be worth just some proactive communication that in general, we're, we can go maskless outdoors, but sometimes you should expect that you will be still asked to mask. Just a little proactive communication with the kiddos could go a long way. And I will have to say it's optional. And the reason I say that is a another dis school in our district went heard the information yesterday and moved so quickly that they were mask free in the, in the yards today. And there were several students that were that wanted to wear their masks. There is kind of a, we've been kind of drilling them that you need to wear the mask and they didn't feel comfortable yet. And so they, the teachers use that as a teachable moment that we're going to accept other people's, you know, you know, people's comfort of that as we work through this. So I think that's another thing that we're going to have to roll out as teachable moments within that so that we're all accepting. Yeah, it, it definitely seems like uh, this was done at, at the soonest moment you possibly could. I'm, I've been checking the daily new cases at the state and national level, 
they are trending sharply down, but uh, they haven't been like down for a long time. <coughs> I was a little surprised. New business uh, discussion, changing early release uh, Friday gap care. Great right. question. Were we, did we have to take a vote on any kind of change? Did we have to uh, approve any kind of change or were, was that what we were discussing, Darius? No, you don't, you could because you have a meeting. Basically, um, you're seeing how I'm interpreting the changes as it applies to our policy and telling you I'm gonna come back with a revised policy for you to vote next meeting. So, I, you know, the problem is I got five districts. I got two meeting tonight. Um, the rest of the districts are gonna go off my administrative, you know, my administrative interpretation of the policy as it's been changed by DESE. Right. So, so you could fall in with the rest of them or you could vote to approve, but it's not, again, um, we would just have to backdate the, uh, Meeting, we did have to change the meeting agenda to show that it was discussed legally um, because it happens within the 24 hour or 48 hour window. Okay. So it's unclear, but I don't have a written policy for changes for you to exactly vote. So I say I'm not prepared for you to actually vote this because I would just be basically I'm going to be accepting the the uh, the release by DESE to change our policies there to to fit um, outdoor recess in our buildings. So. It's kind of messy, like I said, they dumped it on us. And uh, and, I, and what's interesting is that you'll hear different things happening in different districts because this is complicated. And this is where I get angry at Jesse. There's another layer where there's just not a communication between the governor's office and what's going on in education that while we have MOAs, we don't have an MOA regarding masks. Masks. We did a policy and there was no need for that on top of you know, larger unions and larger districts. You know, there's a lot of back and forth. So they have an MOA on masks. So. There are going to be some districts that are going to have to get the union to sign off on an MOA change because the MOA is a, a legal document, you know. And so there's this kind of you're going to hear different, like you know, the superintendents are like, we have to go back and bargain this in the last three days, of, the last three weeks of school. This is, you know, this is the part where it's kind of like, did the governor think about this, you know, or you know, who's who's advising them, that kind of thing. So not to beat up on Charlie, but you know, who's you know that kind of thing, like a media or you know, my phone lit up when he said it on that news conference. Like, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? How are we going to get some school communities are doing emergency meetings to change the thing in order to over, I guess, within collective bargaining law, I won't get down that road. But, um, you know, ours is a little bit different. So that's where we're at. So, no, I'm not looking for a vote. Right. Okay. Yeah. I want to make a proposal. No, I mean, not. I mean, everything sounds good. I think the common sense line is the is the best line. I think it's it's an opportunity for kids to take masks off outside. I think you'll have a number of kids who won't feel comfortable do it. They'll want to keep the mask on outside, and I think that we should respect that. And then I just and we just keep things the same until the end of the year, and then we readjust for next year. It's seventeen and a half days, but no one's coming. Nice. All, All right. right. Early release Friday gap care. All right, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share my screen because it's easiest to, de to describe this with, um, with a visual. All right, so gap care, that's the time on an early release Friday when the students are done with school, but the after care program hasn't started up, okay? And so this goes way back to when we created um, the early release days. I think that was my second year as principal. So it goes back, um, you know, at least seven or eight years. Um, and we created this time in between for students, you know, to kind of stay through to the to the after school program. Um, basically, what we are proposing is that now that we have a reset year, that we are proposing that we do we charge a five dollar fee or fee for that gap care between 1.30 and 3. Um, the money will go toward a healthy snack. Also, the money will go into the after-school program to um, pay for um, after care personnel who are not already working for the district to maybe be able to come in earlier to reduce 
um, student staff ratio and then also free up IAs that may be from the staff covering the gap care so they can be released for PD. Um, the actual fee, it's a nominal fee. Really right now, if you were to do the hourly rate, rate um, you know, it's $6 an hour, we're looking for $5 for an hour and a half. Um, we would provide scholarships for families with financial hardships, and that's done through the principal. Um, and then students would have the option to, to attend the out-of-school time program starting at three. Um, and then the out-of-school time program is $14.50 per day. What was brought up in the two meetings, so this is what happens when you're meeting number three, were some good ideas, so I'll help you kind of roll right through them. So I know you may have thought of them yourself, so I heart started to take that away from you. Um, but one was, um, was it was interesting at the Waitley meeting last week was that they brought up, well, perhaps we don't charge a fee for the families who are enrolled in the after school program because they're already enrolled in that. And those are probably the families most need of the after school because they've enrolled it, you know, because of their jobs and that kind of stuff. And we would only charge for people using the gap care. And then what about multiple children in a family? And can we do a reduction for each additional child? So those are just proposals that were brought up at two of your, um, two of the other school committee meetings. So why are we asking you to do this? Why is the timing now? Um, one, it's a reset year. You know, we didn't have the after school program this year. So it's a good time if you're gonna do a major change like this. The gap care time has really turned into, you know, when we first rolled out this, we were talking about enrichment programs. We weren't looking at the amount of students that were staying for gap care. I think Ben, and you're gonna have to help me more about the programming in, 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 in Sunderland here, but um, there's less of that and more of a recess and some structured events within that it turned into fun time. So more and more kids are staying after and because it's free care. And so the idea here is to put in a, a pause price, um, not something that makes it unattainable, just a small amount that says, you know, you know, it could reduce the numbers we have overall. It also can help pay for, um, you know, it's a free service we've been providing. It can also pay for um, staff members to oversee. We can release some staff members for um, PD that have been tied up because we had to, because of the numbers that we've had in the after school program. And part of this discussion, I got to tell you what the other committees have already done. Both committees have tabled it. They wanted to think about it and vote on it at the June meeting. So I'm kind of putting that out there for you as we put it into this discussion tonight as well. Um, not to put everything on the June meeting, but your your counterparts have all decided to go that route so far. And then Conway after this, we'll see what happens there. Um, but that's the table I set for your discussion and questions. Jessica? Uh, who would be responsible for the accounting and bookkeeping on these payments from families? If some families can't pay it up front at the beginning of the year, who's going to have to Chase them down for chase them down for their installments. Who, this, whose plate are we adding to? Right, right. Um, this would fall. We have an out of school time um, coordinator position who takes care of the billing and, and attendance of those programs, and this would be added on to that. Um, you know, depending on the need of that, we would then have some funds to pay that person to. You know, the first fund would pay that person to oversee that. Additionally, the the the, the bookkeeping of that. And Ben, please jump in if I misspeak because. The out of care programs are a little different in every school. And so if I miss something that's a big a nuance, that's a big deal. Let me you know, correct me. Because no, you, you got it right. Um, our numbers would fluctuate uh, on the Friday early release days. Sometimes we'd have around 50 or 60. And then other days it was pushing close to 100 students. Uh, so we, we would need anywhere from eight to 10 staff members during that time to oversee the after school care. And you typically, know, Oh, and of those, it. they're only staying till three. That that's kind of was the the issue. A lot of those kids are only staying to three and not staying because they need the child care. The for, vast majority were staying until three o'clock. Um, yeah, and for any parents just joining this discussion, uh, I, I certainly remember uh, this whole thing was it started with how do we get professional development for our teachers, uh, make sure that there's time available and. It made sense. Well, we're going to try to do this for families. It wasn't anticipated that uh, there would be as much participation as there has been. And uh, so, I mean, you hate to turn to families and say, well, there's a fee for 
uh, for school. Uh, at the same time, this is a, a, an extra after school thing that, uh, you know, again, it's an early release Friday. So it's during time where on other days there might otherwise be school, but, uh, it's definitely, uh, something that has to be figured out between the instructional assistants that, that provide, uh, supervision, uh, during the event and, and the cost of balancing the budget. Uh, uh, it seems to me we definitely have to do something like this. This has been a problem that's been in need of a solution for a while. So certainly something has to be done. Yeah, I mean, it brings the interesting philosophical question of what's the school's responsibility for child care if it's changing its hours, you know? And so it really does come down to each community and that's why it's not a joint meeting on this because I do think each community has to decide what, it, what the after school care's needs are and what some of the parameters of that would be. Because um, we recognize that, but you know, a lot of other districts do full half days or two half days a month rather than the early release. Are they providing care for between 12 and three on those days? They are not, um, at least not free care without you know the same kind of setup we are. So it's they're different models and we talked a little bit about the different models and why we've chosen one that has more dates with less time rather than you know, half the number of days with the same amount of time but longer times off because of the consistency. Teachers can get started on something one week and you continue to flow things, things without the start, stop, start, stop kind of thing. So, you know, that's what we've, we've already chosen at the last meeting last month that, that we're gonna continue that this next year. So anyway, that's just the me filling the void. I don't see the word vote on it next to the agenda. Go ahead. No, Greg, I was just going to echo exactly what you said. I remember this being a sticking point from the beginning. I think the, the, when it started, it was the, the idea was there weren't that many kids who were actually going to stay after, and, and, and so it really wouldn't be a problem. And I also remember somebody saying something, but, you know, what, what else are they going to do? And they can just stay it's free. It's going to be awesome. It's great. And so this has been sticking for a long time, and it has come out with, you know, it has caused trouble with IAs and who's going to oversee it. So, you know, I, I think this is moving in the right direction. Um, so is there an appetite to, I, like I said, I didn't see vote next to the agenda item. I didn't know if there was an appetite to vote this now, or do we want to follow the lead of the other committees and, uh, maybe get some more specific language. I, I know that the idea of, uh, uh, for those families who can't afford it, that, that it could be waived, you know, that addresses a lot of my concerns. Uh, and, uh, I'd be prepared to, yeah, either way, whether we want to vote it or, or push out. To see if some common language gets wrapped around it. I also thought it was really interesting. The if you're not signed up for the after school program, you have to pay for it. And that's another thing. Those are add ons that I added on since the last meeting. Obviously, I talked about those, but that's an interesting premise too, because you're just adding a bigger bill to, to their their needs because they have, you know, you know, most likely work obligations until five o'clock um, or you know, when they pick up their kids. So, you know, we're we're adding to their bill where um, if someone who's picking up at three, that may not be the case. It's still, there might be people working until three, so I understand that as well, but that may not be the case. It might be something that, you know, they're able to, the kids say they have fun, so they are allowed to stay. So, you know, it, they need to um, join those who have to pay for the, the later care, you know, that kind of thing. So I thought that was very interesting. It was an interesting point. Yeah. yeah, I just think we can, I'm perfectly happy waiting until next meeting to actually vote on this. Let it percolate a little more, let Darius talk it up some more, and. Then I think we'll we'll have a we'll have a, a more solid thing to vote on. You know, and then also, if there's anyone out there who wants to make a public comment, that'll give them time if they want to show up at the next meeting and have any say. Yep. All right. Do we need a motion? And, uh, no, we don't need a motion or a vote. We, we're just gonna. Uh, well, we don't need to motion the table because it's on the agenda. Oh, but there's no vote next to it. I see what you're saying. I, I, there, okay. There's no nothing indicating we are going to vote. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so review uh, director of business administrators contract as negotiated by subcommittee. And, so uh, this is one where. So I was just jumping in to recommend what the other committees did is they went through the reports. And then if this committee wants to do an executive session and discuss 
the anything has to do with the negotiation, you can go to that and then come back to vote it in the public session. But that way, anybody else on here, because if we go to an executive session, it gets very, you know, people are sitting there. I agree. Let's check your points. Let's see, any committees? Here. Yeah, I just want to report on the capital planning committee where we had, um, as it turned out, we had two projects that uh, I think I said at our, our last meeting, maybe they had been uh, approved by the capital planning committee, but then the uh, the one of them for the um, steamer boiler in the cafeteria, uh, it turned out that the numbers that were being used to estimate the cost were uh from some prior century and so we got some uh we got a current bid and the number went up and um after some discussion and uh at the meeting and we had jeff mcdonald who's the the recently hired food service director come and uh answer questions the committee voted uh, unanimously to support that um and then the other project was the uh continuation of the rim band repair and that continues to be supported uh the uh, select board on this it was uh, yesterday evening uh, voted uh, 302 to uh, recommend uh, the uh, full list of capital projects that the committee had been had, had presented that included the two for the schools. So that's moving forward. It still needs a town meeting vote, but it seems like it's uh, it's heading the right direction. Uh, the select board is not yet uh taking a position on the various uh cpa uh funded projects one of which is the early childhood playground um but i'm anticipating that to happen next week at their meeting and so far you know it got unanimous support at uh, the cpc meeting where that was considered so um i'm i'm both hopeful and confident that's going to also come to fruition so Outstanding. And, and uh, I guess thank the, other, you. the other thing that was the frontier, because they saved money on the bid on their track, they had put forward a proposal for, for some uh, maintenance items uh, that each town was going to pay its share of. And then they decided that they can cover that through money they saved on the track project. So um, the town is is relieved of the expense for that. And uh, I, you know, wants to, again, thank you back to the school for being always aware of the fact that the town's funds aren't unlimited and, and thank you for doing that. Outstanding. Yeah, the gratitude goes goes both ways. It's, we're, we're working together and, and getting stuff done. Um, let's see. Ben, you want to go next? Sure. Um, we recently received some walk and roll to school accolades. Uh, Sunderland Elementary School was awarded a certificate of resiliency and adaptability uh, from the state uh, Safe Routes to School. Um, this certificate was awarded to schools that demonstrated a strong commitment to safe student walking and biking throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, once again, this was organized by our, one of our teachers, Matthew Howell, um, and we have a fall event each year and a spring one as well. And it's uh, definitely one of the highlights each school year. And other things going on, this is Spirit Week. We have our Sunderland in Action Day uh, coming up this Thursday where students will be performing community service projects both on campus and uh, both around the town offices and the, the new river walk as well. PTO meeting on Thursday evening, and we have our kindergarten screening on Friday. There is a school council meeting this coming Monday, and I do believe there is a vacant uh, school committee seat for the school council right now um, with Maisie's departure. And then uh, sixth grade step up day, we have a virtual orientation and then sixth grade graduation, the last week of school. So there's a lot happening. Outstanding. Questions, comments? 
Go ahead, Peter. I mean, should we be uh, should we be getting someone to uh, join the school council who's a school committee rep? Uh, seems like we ought to. Do we need to have? I think we have a general reorg next month. Is that is that the case? We have the reorg next month. If you if there's a meeting between now and then, and you want to just assign someone, Greg, you probably could do that. Or someone volunteers and takes your assignment. I can also provide everyone with an update. Do you have a date for it, Ben? Yeah, it's this coming Monday. Um, what is that? The twenty fourth, May twenty fourth at three fifteen. Okay. I could go. Outstanding. Okay. All right. Uh, Superintendent. Uh, no report. What we've had going on. All right. Uh, in that case, uh, I think we we're going to go into executive session uh, for discussion. Come out, vote, and uh, and end the meeting. Is that uh, essentially what I'm hearing? Yep. And so after you right. read, so after I'm you read, read the language. After you read the language, yeah. everybody completely leaves. I'll make sure you're out. Go to the other site, yeah. go to the other link, go on to that. We'll talk about that. Then we come back to here. I'm just saying hey. it all out loud because this might be Megan's first time. And if I could jump in again, I did forget to mention a couple of events that we're planning at the beginning of next school year. Um, one is our open house. And if all goes to plan, we'll be welcoming our community, hopefully back into the building or some variation. And then also we have a um, back to school celebration event um, that's going to take place shortly after that. Um, it's going to, we're uh, tabbing it as a diversity event and uh, another way that we're going to be celebrating the new school year, but it's going to be a school-wide event taking place most likely um, outside with music and other festivities. So there's a lot to look forward to. Outstanding. Hey. All right, so we'll, we'll, now for the magic words, followed by a roll call vote. All right, uh, executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct contractual uh, contract negotiations with non-union personnel, Director of Business Administration. Uh, yeah, I make a motion to yeah go to executive session. Uh, second. I'll second. Outstanding. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Keith? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Megan? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. Okay. Unanimous. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. Okay. Megan, do you have the link for that? The link for what was it? <laughs> the executive session. I, I'm not on it. Um, I can call. Oh, shoot. No, I probably have it. Sorry, I got a couple emails and I forgot which one was. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <Okay. laughs>
Nobody wanted to wait around for us. Hey. All right. So we're back. Uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve the uh, uh, contract is negotiated by the, the subcommittee. I'll make a, do you, do you need a motion? I, I think so. Are we, are we voting? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'll move that we approve the contract as negotiated by the subcommittee for, uh, Shelley Parada, director of business services. Outstanding. Second. I'll second. Outstanding. Make a second. All right. Uh, Keith? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Megan? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. Unanimous. And then I think we adjourn and we'll, we'll reorg uh, next time. So everybody think about uh, what you want to do in the next year's uh, committee. All right. I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Outstanding. All right. Megan? Yes. <laughs> yes. Peter? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Good, Good to have you here, Megan.